just as I started, I just want to say it is incredible to stand up here as family, and it's not, you know, it's not about a prepared speech. It's about doing life together, and um, I just want to give a shout out to some of my friends that came out. I see the Danes at the back and the hockeys, and and even just to have my family here, my brother and my uncle George all the way from the UK. You know, it means a lot, and I think that's that's the context of today. A lot of this, I want to try and bring in some of my own personal testimony. Um, I'm going to be continuing the story that Lynn started last week on Joseph. He did such a great job um, giving us an overview of the story of Joseph. So I'm going to assume a little bit that we know the story. If you haven't ever read it, please do. It's an incredible account of, of how God intervened um, in Joseph's life and saved the nation. And today really what I want to do is, is just a kind of few moments that God put on my heart. Um, just a few things that in that story God spoke to me about and some of it links with my testimony. And there's three kind of key points. And uh, you know, if you're, if you're a note taker or a type A person like myself and you need three points, I'm going to give them to you just so you, we can try and follow. The first is that Joseph um, showed that he was an oak of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. The second is that Joseph showed what I call redemptive forgiveness. And we're going to go into that. It was so amazing just that, uh, Wendy, we know you here from the Lord <laughs> because your, your thing that you shared, it's just incredible how God's worked through this morning already. And you talking about forgiveness, it's pretty much one of my key things today. And not just forgiveness, redemptive forgiveness and loving like Jesus. And then the third point um, I'm going to touch on is that when all might seem lost, but God. Okay. Are we all okay? I know it's like 28 degrees today, which I think you need to take five minutes or you're off your bridge time. The hotter it gets, every degree you need to take a few minutes off apparently. Of so hopefully you'll bear with me. Sorry for the guy. Matt, you're right at the back there. You're in trouble, boy. You got no ink on there. So let's jump straight in. I, I want to jump into a key moment in the Joseph story where Joseph finally goes before Pharaoh. And the context here is that God has shown him favor, even though he was sold into slavery, on every step of that journey. So he gets favor in Potiphar's house. Um, Potiphar makes him the head of his household, and, and very evidently God's hands on him. And then he gets unjustly thrown in jail. But in jail, God's hands upon him, and he ends up running the jail for the jailer. And then eventually he gets before Pharaoh. And straight after interpreting Pharaoh's dreams, this is where we're going to pick up in Genesis 41, 33. So if you're taking notes or you've got your Bible to follow ahead, I'm going to be reading out the good old Pharaoh 40 Navi. And this is what it says, starting in verse 33. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by famine. So what's happening here? It sounds pretty simple. He throws this out there, but it's what I would like to call a case of um, elegant simplicity. And what that is is when you have a pretty intensely complex problem but you come up with a really simple solution that solves it. And why do I say that? Well, there's a huge amount of variables here. You know, Joseph could have said, take 10% of the grain, or take 30%, or like our government, take 45% of the grain. You know, he's, he's, he's bringing in a pretty much Old Testament tax system for the first time here, and he, and he hits it at 20%. You know, it's, it's highly complex. He doesn't say, look, Pharaoh, I've interpreted these dreams. Can I just have some time to go away back to my prison cell? Um, and work out some economic forecasts and uh, econometric predictions and then I'll come back to you tomorrow with a really good plan. He doesn't do that. God gives him this incredible, in the moment, download from the storehouse. And he gives Pharaoh this perfect implementable roadmap, a full taxation system, and solves this problem of how to run a country through firstly a boom period and then a bust period. It was profound. And, um, you know, it was just... You know, what I said to front, well, it was just far above his own expertise. You know, Joseph wasn't an economist. He wasn't a finance minister. Um, yes, he had run parts of his household. 
um, theologians reckon only for a few years, but running a household, you know, anyone in this room today that kind of has earns an income and, and buys groceries and, and runs a household. So, you know, running a household doesn't exactly mean that you, you're ready to, to solve a, a full tax problem in a few seconds. Joseph doesn't, you know. And he didn't have anything else besides the fact that he was incarcerated. So he couldn't even put that on his seat. So what's God doing here? Well, if we read in now verse 38, a little bit on, this is what Ferris says. He says, asks all his advisors in the room, he says, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? So Ferris doesn't say, you know, can we find an economist to back test Joseph's assumptions? Uh, should we bounce this off the finance minister? You know, you've got to feel a little bit sorry for the Egyptian finance minister at that time. He's out of a job immediately. But he doesn't, he doesn't say that. And he doesn't grill Joseph about what business school he went to or, or what his experience was. And thankfully he didn't, because we know Joseph was kind of this nomadic shepherd family. So the only experience he probably had was, I don't know, like the animal husbandry of goats or something like that. He wasn't, he didn't have anything there to give Pharaoh. He just simply asks, uh, Pharaoh doesn't ask for that. He just says, can we find anyone in whom we acknowledge the spirit of the living God is in? And the first point today is that we should never underestimate the favor of God. And so a personal testimony to start here was that I remember very, very clearly, um, eight, this is about 15 years ago. I just started my job as a wealth manager. I was eight months into a one-year internship. So basically what that means is I knew absolutely nothing. They're absolutely nothing. And I remember our national manager summons me for a meeting with him. Um, drove out to Pine Town, he was meeting at some office, and we were walking and I didn't have a clue what this was about. You know, I thought I could very well be fired today, I didn't know what this was about. And I remember sitting across this man, across this massive big oak desk, and he sat there staring at me, kind of quiet, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, what is going on here? And he just looked like he was sizing me up, and he said, I'm going to take a chance on you. I said, okay. <laughs> what does that mean? Um, and he just explained that, you know, one of the, the, one of the managers was, was leaving and, and trying to take a whole lot of clients with him. He said, I'm going to take a chance on you. I'm going to task you with saving all these clients for this, this, this firm. And, you know, I believe he took a chance on me, not because of my CV, not because of my experience. You know, there were lots of well more suitably qualified people to do that job, to be tasked with that, than me, eight months into a one-year internship. But I believe he saw something in me, and I guarantee that it was the Spirit of God inside of me. It was his favor and providence. And just like Pharaoh saw in Joseph, that man saw something in me that day. And that was the Holy Spirit in me. So my first question, thanks Lucas, my first question is, you know, are we walking in step with the Spirit of God today? Like Joseph undoubtedly was. Do we expect downloads from a heavenly storehouse on a daily basis? Are we living a life that's demonstrative of the presence of God? You know, are we set apart? Or do we look like everybody else working a 9 to 5 and spinning our little wheel in the rat race? So the lesson here is that when our hearts are surrendered to God and we're attentive to His, his nudgings, like we need, that's how we'll change the world. You know, it's not our heads, it's not our experience and our talents alone, even though God uses that but it's primarily the, the Spirit and the presence of God in us that will give us favor. And that's how we will be like Isaiah 61, 4, so that we can be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. Okay, so, all okay, Nate? So, that's the first one. The second one, as I just said, it's so incredible that Wendy brought that word. I want to speak about how Joseph showed redemptive forgiveness. Okay, so now we know in the end of the story, or we might not know, but basically in the end of the story of Joseph, he showed total forgiveness towards his brothers. You know, complete and utter total forgiveness. We know that. But I want to unpack this a bit, because that's a bit shortcutting actually what happened. There's a journey here. Now, why do I say there's a journey? Glad you asked. So, Genesis 41, verse 50. Again, if you're taking notes of reading NIV. And this is what it says. And this is to unpack why I'm not to journey. Before the years of famine came, 
So this is in the, the seven boom years. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Senath, daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. So now I believe that this is where it starts, is because it was pretty obvious that the pain and reality of his brother's kind of betrayal was still completely real in Joseph's life two decades after it happened. They sold him into slavery at 17. This is in his early 30s. Okay? It was completely real. And how did he choose to deal with that? Well, I believe he chose to numb the pain by trying to forget the pain. And, he, and, he, and why do I say that? Well, because at that time, he's kind of prime minister of Egypt. He could have easily said to Pharaoh, look, Pharaoh, can I borrow two fast horses? I'm just going to trot off to Canaan. I just want to reconcile with my brothers. That's how I'm here, remember. Uh, I just want to, want to go sort this out. He says, give me a week off. And I'm sure Pharaoh would have granted him that wish, but he didn't. <coughs> he did not ask for permission. Now, what does he do? He names, he gives he is his firstborn a Hebrew name, Manasseh. And that means God made me forget my family and my troubles. Now, does that not strike you a little bit odd? The God, the unchanging God, would God have made Joseph forget his family? And I want to say, no, he didn't. God would have never wanted him to forget his family. But it was Joseph's coping mechanism at the point, at that point. And God's gracious, so he allows that. And we know that God wouldn't, because well, firstly, God is a God of family and love. You know, honor your mother and father, it'll go well with you. But more importantly, like Glenn told us last week, who was one of Joseph's family? Who was one of his brothers? Judah. And why is Judah important? Well, Judah's in the lineage of Jesus. He's Jesus' great, 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 great grandfather. So would God really want to, have wanted Joseph to forget the very person of why God put him there and did this whole redemptive plan, would God have wanted him to forget the very reason he put him there to save the Israel nation so that Jesus would come 2,000 years later? No, he wouldn't. And so we know that if it's not good, it's not done. God wasn't finished his redemptive work with Joseph and his plan to heal him and save this Israelite nation. And so let's pick it up in Genesis 48 verse 14. I want to show you a very interesting thing just to conclude this one. This is just, again, to give it some context. At the end of Joseph's father's life, Joseph's father was Jacob, who was renamed Israel. At the end of his life, he takes his two sons to his dad, Israel, to bless them. And in the Hebrew culture, you bless the first son with a double portion. It's a bit unfair, I know, but that's how it worked. And the right hand of the person blessing denoted double portion son, double blessing. So right hand double Sorry, you weren't born first. Um, so this is what it says in Genesis 48, 14. But Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head, even though he was the younger. And crossing his arms, he put the left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. When Joseph saw his father placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased. So he took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to him, No, my father, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He too will become a people, and he too will become great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he, and his descendants will become a group of nations. He blessed him that day and said, In your name will Israel pronounce this blessing. May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. You know, why did he do this? And as I was preparing, I just felt this. No one obviously knows. I'm not a theologian, but no one knows except God why he prompted Israel to do that. But give me a little bit of creative leeway if you wouldn't mind. And could the reason be that God nudges Israel to cross his arm is that God doesn't honor the fact that Joseph tried to forget his journey or his family. But he actually honors the purpose of that journey being to bless him and through him being a, be a blessing. And in a sense, that's showing God's glory, that his, 
plan for salvation for that Hebrew people was far above Joseph's comfort or Joseph's convenience. And again, we see this in Jesus' life. Far above Jesus' personal feelings was God's redemptive plan for his people and for us today. And thank God that that's what God blesses. So it's an incredible story. And so this, this thing of um, forgiveness is a journey for, jo for Joseph. When his brothers finally arrive in Egypt, so now this is a couple of years into the famine time, they've run out of food. Um, so they finally arrive there. They don't know it's Joseph, obviously. They just think it's the Prime Minister of Egypt. I was having a laugh in my head. You know those Egyptian guys are probably wearing one of those like long little goodies with a little hat thing. You know, those, and I probably had some like eyeliner on. You know those Egyptian guys used to get a bit dolled up, a bit dodgy. But, but I was going to say, otherwise I think they would have potentially recognized the similarities of like, I don't know, maybe that family had big ears or you don't know, but he was probably dolled up a bit as, as the Prime Minister. So they don't recognize him at all. And he, and, he, and he goes on to play this pretty elaborate game, okay? If you, if you read it, it's an elaborate game. He plays games with them. Uh, he puts a silver cap, a cup in their sack so that when they leave, it looks like they've stolen this special cup. It's a very special cup. And you know, he gets them in a position that now their lives are forfeit because they're thieves. And the one night he gets them all drunk uh, to like check that they, and the whole thing, why did he do this, this elaborate game? Well, quite simply, he wanted to see if their hearts had changed. He wanted to see if they were truly repentant. That if they, that if, had they changed? And you know what he judged that they had? So there was tears, there was reconciliation, and he forgives them. Okay? But he goes further. So when you forgive someone, you basically let them off the penalty for their sin. So, you know, for, for their crime of selling them to slavery, maybe you would say, well, I for an hour, okay, you're going to be my slaves for the rest of my life because you sold me into slavery. Or maybe he would have judged that they should die or their lives were forfeit or that they should be incarcerated for the rest of their life. But he doesn't. He lets them go completely. But he doesn't just do that. So he doesn't just forgive them. He redemptively forgives them. And what does that mean? Well, he doesn't just forgive them. He actually goes a step further and blesses them. Okay? And he, and he redeems their inheritance. And he gives them wealth and land that they never deserved. So he takes them from impoverished shepherds to basically property barons of the best of the land of Egypt, the area of Goshen. So not only in this incredible interchange does he let them go of the penalty of their heinous crime, he says, you know what, I'm not only going to let you go, I'm going to give you this incredible wealth. And it's such an incredible story. Why? Well, because Joseph is foreshadowing Christ. And it was Christ who redeemed our inheritance that was lost through sin. He didn't just let us go of the pain of our crime, he's blessed us. And we were impoverished, we had nothing to barter for our souls souls when Jesus purchased our lives with his blood and restored our destinies. And Ephesians 1 3, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So it's an incredible interchange and I want to now just bring one practical angle now. Like Wendy had said, what if we've been wronged? How are we meant to do this practically? You know, what are one or two practical handles from Joseph's story to help us live out this thing of redemptive forgiveness. And I only want to say to you, it's all I felt to share, the first one, and I think Wendy actually said this, but vengeance belongs to God. It's not our job to be judge, jury, and executioner. Genesis 50, 15, so let's read, this is right at the end, when Israel has died, Joseph's father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, Your father left us these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I asked you for, to forgive your brothers the sins and wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When the message came to him, Joseph wept. You know, why did he weep? Well, I think he was just so... Frustrated. You know, so at that point, after all the, this is a long time after he forgave him, after all of that, you can still see there's still a little seed there. So he wept because he knew that they actually didn't trust in his forgiveness. 
And again, he wasn't Jesus. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said, and here's the key one, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intends it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to you. This is the same man that named his first son to forget them. You know, suddenly you realize the journey here. He's seen that God meant it for good. He's totally changed. God has changed his heart. And more importantly, he's got this incredible understanding that he's not the judge. God is. And it's not his job to seek vengeance. So he says, what is wrong with you? I'm not God. Judging you isn't my job. I've already forgiven you. And it's incredible, again, foreshadowing of Christ, his reality there. And um, God knew, I mean God knew, Joseph knew that God would hold his brothers accountable. They would give an account. And we know that. We give an account for every single one of our actions. And yes, there are repercussions for sin. But it wasn't his job on that day or any day thereafter to judge his brothers. That was God's. So that's the first practical handle. The second one is that it is as simple and as hard to do this as living with Jesus' love. It's the true standard. You know, we need God's love in our hearts to truly forgive. And, and why do I say that? Well, you know, Joseph set this example of love thousands of years before Jesus arrived on earth. And that Old Testament commandment from Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And we saw Jesus echoed it in Matthew 22, 39, when the Pharisees asked him, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the second, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Okay, but there's a little problem with it. Um, I don't know if you picked it up, but the problem is that it defines the bar for love as our personal measure or our personal interpretation or experience of love. And why is that a problem? Well, we know we live in a world that many people have serious identity problems. They might not even love themselves. We don't, why? Well, because we don't always see ourselves as God sees us. You know, it's a real thing. So sometimes our loving someone as we love ourselves when we haven't been loved well is a really big problem because we bring that baggage into then how we love someone. And thankfully, thankfully, our Messiah presented an alternative way which is actually what Joseph foreshadowed. John 13, 34. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. So he just resets that one. Resets the commandment. Actually, don't love as you love yourself. Love as I have loved you. Whoa, the bar just got a million times higher to now a Christ-like love. Um, you know, it's a perfect love. It's, it's an unselfish love. It's a, it's a completely redemptive love. It's sacrificial, servant-hearted. And, and more importantly, it's just so counterculture and so different to the love that we see on earth that that's why Jesus said, that's how you're going to change this world. You're going to show them the way I've loved you. And that will stand out. And that's how all men will know that you are my disciple. That you love one another as I have loved you. So the question here is, you know, do we live as people who, because of Jesus, show redemptive forgiveness? Do we love based on our personal experience and our understanding of love? Or rather, do we love based on our relationship with Jesus and how He loves us? Okay, so it's quite a, it's quite a big one, and, and I'm sure we can talk more about it, but it's an incredibly profound one. Because if, brother, if Joseph didn't let his brothers go, we know the story wouldn't have ended as amazingly as it did. So we're doing well. Last one, but God. So if there's a low point in Joseph's story. It, it's probably when he was towards the end of his incarceration, sitting in jail. You know, he, firstly, he was there unjustly for a crime he didn't commit. Um, and he goes, you know, overnight from a slave obtaining favor in Potiphar's house to just forgotten overnight. 
We don't know exactly how long he was in jail, but theologians reckon, look, he, he started working with Potiphar at 17, and it probably wouldn't have taken long for Potiphar's wife to start chasing him around the house. Okay, so they reckon about three years. <clears throat> they don't know exactly, but they reckon about three years. That's all his innings would have been in Potiphar's house before he was hurled into jail. So in total, he would have been there for 10 years. But there was this point, and this is the low point I want to talk about, when he thinks he probably has an out. It's eight years in. Not eight years, eh? This is not the prison break jail with like perfect warm white down lights and uh, no one can stab you because there's cameras everywhere. This is kind of a, a hectic, I don't want to paint the picture, but it's, it's probably mean, you know, and grimy and not a great toilet and horrible food and rats and you name it. And so, eight years in, he gets this opportunity. Pharaoh's cupbearer and Pharaoh's baker, rocker, and uh, he throws a great pass about interpreting your dreams. He gets it right, and he thinks, this is it. This is my light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you, Jesus. Well, not Jesus. Thank you, God. And um, so he says to them, please just remember me in front of Pharaoh, because he knows three days later they get, they get released. So probably as they're walking out, where he's nailed it on them, he told them, in three days you're going to get released. They get released. Wow. And so as they walk out, he says, just remember me. And so he's thinking, this is it. This is my heart. Finally, after eight years, I'm just here. They're going to tell Pharaoh how unjust it was that I'm even here. And the first week probably goes by, and the second, and the third, and they forget him. And it's two years, two years that they forget him. Now, at that point, he's probably thought, you know, I'm never going to here. You know, at the low point, he probably thinks, what's the point of it? I was just in my life. We don't know, I'm just being creative. But I'm telling you, it probably was real. And, you know, the incredible thing is Joseph doesn't lose his testimony or his faith in God. And I want to say to you today that, you know, you might feel like you're in prison today. Or that your dreams have been dashed unjustly. And you've got no way out in your own street. You've got, you got nothing. I want to say to you, but God. You know, the night is often darkest before the dawn. But God. And um, I'm going to share another personal testimony. Um, myself and Kirsten, for the last kind of two to three years, have been in our, what I would call a financial prison. And why do I say that? Well, we amazingly bought this incredible piece of land up north with these incredible sea views, and we had a plan to build a house on it. And through a series of events that I don't need to go into, um, it wasn't possible. And more importantly, we felt God say, no, no don't, don't go ahead. So we put the land up for sale, and this was in early uh, 2020, and then lockdown happened, um, and then the riots happened, and then the floods happened, and basically we lost two very, very keen buyers, um, and then on top of that, we got caught out because um, basically the, the, the rates on the land were 10 times higher. Not one time, not ten, ten times higher than if it was a built house. And so we were completely caught up with that. It wasn't fair that the rates were that much higher. It wasn't just, but it was real. You know, we had the best agents on it. No buyers after the riots and the looting and, and, and the floods and COVID. And it was kind of this bad God moment. Why? Well, it was my low point probably about May this year. Um, just feeling like... You know, I'm not getting out of this one um, unscathed. Well, I already wasn't unscathed, but I'm really not getting out of this easily. And I just received another love letter from the developer to say, well, FYI, because you haven't built, we're going to now double levy, which was another massive amount of money. And I was, I was at a low point. I was at that point of saying, like, Lord, please. And I remember um, I was pacing up and down the Victory Academy field watching my little boy, Lucas, play soccer. And, um, and I just was kind of just crying out to God saying like, please, you know, please Jesus, your people are tired. You know, this is enough now. Like, I need you to break it. Please God. This is like two and a half years of this. I need you to intervene. I need, I need a buyer. And yeah, I looked down <clears throat> into the grass and I saw a little glint of silver. So I picked, out, picked it up and it was this thing, the five red coin. 
And um, you know, it's amazing just for the first part because you know how, how kids are like magpies, eh? There's no shiny objects on the side of kids' soccer fields ever. Because you know, they, they find any bit of money and, and that was the first amazing part that there was a fire rent coin just sitting there. But it wasn't that, it was it was what fire rent coin it was. And and this fire rent coin is one of those nineteen ninety four presidential inauguration coins. Remember those ones? Okay. You, you, you're not done, you weren't even born in that thing. <laughs> you say, what now? Um, and so, why it was important is because at that moment, when I looked at it, I mean, I went cold because I knew God was talking to me. Why? Well, because this coin meant a huge amount to me personally. You wouldn't know that, but when I was young, I used to collect things. Key rings, I loved coins and stamps. And I used to love the coin so much. And, and when this thing came out, I remember getting one and like loving this thing. I didn't know they had minted like 10 million of them or something, so I thought it was quite special. But you know, through the years I'd lost it. But it, it still meant a lot to me. I, I remember it so fondly. And as I picked it up, I knew God was talking to me. I knew he was kind of saying that like that song, there's another in the fire. You know, I'm with you. I see you. And in the moment, in that moment, I knew it was going to be okay. I knew God would make a way where there was no way. There was no evident way. Best agents, long story, no way. You know what happened about two weeks after that? I got a phone call. I remember sitting in my office, looking out. I got a really cool CV in my office. I remember looking out, and my phone rings, and I pick up this thing, and I literally almost dropped the phone. And this guy said, I heard you selling some land. I said, yes. And the child was like, too excited. <laughs> And he was a private buyer. And um, long story short, a few weeks after that, we signed a sale agreement. And, you know, I, I thought at that point the pain would be over quite quickly. It wasn't. It took another five months from May to now almost, and many hurdles. But I want to stand here as, as a personal testament and say, praise be to the Lord, because the transfer went through last, this Friday, two days ago. Um, And I know it's awesome that Roy and Megan here and my brother and even Matt and you guys have seen seen the pain of this and how hard it's been. And also now just an incredible testimony of God's goodness. You know, we know God's sovereign, but he's not just sovereign, sovereignly good. You know. And where you might feel the narrative of your life has taken a wrong turn, or you see it in a place where you're incapable in your own strength of getting out. Like Joseph, don't use faith. It's not where you sit on earth that counts, but it's where you sit in heaven. And there's often a spiritual context to our physical predicament. And Ephesians 2 verse 6 says, And God raised us up with Christ, and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace, expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So just, I want to end by sharing a picture of that. Um, myself and Kurt went for a prayer walk the other day, praying for God to give me grace to preach. <laughs> and um, as we were praying, God just gave me a picture, amazingly. It doesn't happen to me very often. And um, it was a picture of a white flag. And, um, and Georgia, thank you for my white flag. Georgia made this for me yesterday. <laughs> Very good, Georgia. And, um, you know, I just felt that, well firstly, what is this white flag? Okay, well, not a good thing in this context. Sometimes white's a good thing, not today. But basically, the white flag in war times, we're going to talk about in that context, is used to indicate that, you know, you were either exempt from battle, so like a medic, or that you and your units or you and yourself had surrendered. So you'd wave your white flag. I'm out. Stop shooting me. Stop shooting at me. <laughs> yeah. And, um, well, you put it up like this and then come up to check that they stop shooting. Okay. And, um, you know, I feel today that some of us, either through the lies of the enemy or through literal exhaustion um, from just years of crying out and not seeing a breakthrough, that we've waved this white flag over some of the areas that I've spoken about. And that, you know, you might have waved a white flag on, on your ability to, to be an oak of righteousness and to carry the presence of God to an unsaved world, you could have just said, I'm tired of this. I just want to be PC now. You know, you might have felt intimidated in front of other religions. You might have felt intimidated in front of unknown parents, this politically correct kind of woke worldview. So you might have said, okay, let's just wave the white flag. All all roads lead to Rome. Let's just wave it. We're tired. Tired of our kid? No. 
and you might be struggling with unforgiveness and, and struggling to accept Christ's love for you, that He sees you as perfect. And that in turn it's affecting your ability to forgive others. So you just wave the white flag. And you might even like us, you know, you might have had your wall up your walls, your back is up against the wall financially. So, you know, or in a relationship, or with your health, anything. So you just it's it's give up. And you know on top of that is that we've got an enemy prowling around us. He says, Wait flat, wait flat, you're tired now. God doesn't want you to, to, to hurt you. Just, just wave the flag. Give up. Give up. And I want to say today, okay, throw the flag away. But I want to say today that, but God, yeah. Jesus is alive. He's seated on his throne. He's a victorious God. And I want to say today that it's time to stand on his truth and his word again. And I believe prophetically, I had to hide a chest so my kids wouldn't get too excited. And prophetically, it's time not to wave a white flag. But it's time to un- unsheath the sword, okay? And, and it's time to unse- un- unsheath the sword. You know, this is made for one thing. You know what it's made for, okay? This is a this is a weapon made for warfare, and and it's a it's a it's a weapon made for Christ, a victorious King, who can come riding into any situation that we find ourselves in. And I say today that you know, for all of us, that, that we're not going to wave a white flag. That it's time to not just take ground but to actually go to war with Jesus on every single thing that might come against him, that no weapon forged against us will prosper. And in summary today, you know, as we do this thing called life together, let's walk closely with the Holy Spirit. You know, let's forgive offenses in a Christ-like way and love people in a Christ-like and redeemed way. And let's never, ever give up hope that you know, even when all might seem lost, but God, and He's with us. Amen. Amen. Is that not amazing? Is that not amazing? George, please come up to the front. George, come on, George. I need you. This is Anna's brother George, and uh, as you can see this morning in, in this whole preach, there's a lot of there's a lot of history, there's a lot of testimony, there's a lot of God speaking deep stuff in our hearts and showing us His goodness. And uh, the whole time Alexia is preaching, I was struggling because you know me, I like watches. It's like a magpie watching, he's looking at his watch the whole morning, and that's in a in a mega seamaster which his dad always used to wear. And whenever his dad used to preach, I always used to step, look at his watch. When Nick would pray for you, he'd look at his watch. And uh, as your hand was moving, I could see Nick's it, it's the same kind of skin as me, and strawberry blonde hair, and white hairs on his arm. And George bought Nick the watch. This is his brother-in-law, bought the watch for Nick. Nick gave it to Alexi. And as Alexi is preaching this morning, George, I want you to know that the testimony of your life and your generosity, and your faithfulness to Jesus goes up as a fragrant offering into him in this morning. And as Alexi preached like an absolute flipping hero, like a warrior called by God to declare his goodness, it's through the faithfulness of you and your family that people get to experience an incredible story of God's faithfulness and God's goodness. So I want us to stand up. And I'm going to ask George to pray for us. I know George has got lots going on, but I believe there's a faithfulness in Him that God wants to release over us. Alexis said a profound thing this morning. If it's not good, it's not done. And God's got us in the palm of His hand. There's an incredible moment, it's a holy moment this morning of God doing stuff through a family which we get the blessing of.
that we are working the promise and uh, we will not give up. We will trust in you and let you set us free. Thank you for the words today, Lord, and we should forgive. And so much of it is a mother of God that you forgive. Them. Even the great things that have been done against us, Lord, that you will change our hearts. I pray, Lord, for this whole church community. That you go with us, you go before us, Lord, you place angels around us. We have protection and covering the name of Jesus. And you stay the hand of the enemy upon us. Show us who loves it, wish us harm, keep us open, this is disease and injury. And we just pray in the last that you will overrule uh, and all that is coming against against us from God. Thank you, Lord, that we are a family. Thank you that you love us. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to share this word, to pray. And thank you always. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Brilliant verse. Lastly, I want us to take this moment this morning and don't let it just go. I feel like some of us need to make some phone calls, probably write some letters, find some five grand coins. You don't see it by chance. I, don't, I gave up the, the understanding coincidence and chance many, many years ago. God brought you here this morning for a reason. As George prayed there, there's a forgiveness that comes that we need to forgive. You need to maybe write some letters, maybe send them, maybe write letters and burn them. Even as I, you know, in my journey, God's still teaching me about forgiving my dad, and you know the story. And this morning, there's been such a profound clarity to that thing of redemptive forgiveness. Amen? Alexi, why don't you give Alexi another hand?